Good evening, everyone. How are we doing tonight? All right. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we're really thrilled to have this opportunity to showcase uh, Lori Getz, who is a renowned expert uh, in the field of cyber education. And we were just so privileged uh, to have her talk to a lot of people today here on campus. Uh, Lori started her day speaking to all upper and middle school faculty. She then spoke to the seventh grade. She spoke to all upper school students. She spoke to fourth and fifth grade students. She spoke to our coaches. And then just before coming here, she did a spot for NBC News. Uh, um, so we, we thought that was rather uh, uh, fantastic. And this is an important topic of conversation. Um, you know, Scientific American just had this interesting article about uh, our uh, people's uh, rather complicated uh, relationship with technology over the years. And they even cited Socrates, who bemoaned the advent of writing. Uh, because what it would do to, to memory uh, and how that would impact people. Um, and so we've always had this uh, interesting relationship with technology. Uh, and it's complicated. And that's why we're so fortunate to have Lori here with us. Lori is, as I said, an expert in the field. Uh, this is her third year with us at Cooper. Uh, and we are so privileged that she's, she's back again. Uh, since 2004, she has spoke uh, and worked as an instructional technologist in Los Angeles, California. She has a Master's of Arts in Educational Technology from San Diego State University and is certified by iSafe.org as an Internet Safety Specialist. In September 2008, Lori founded Cyber Education Consultants and began speaking to students, parents, and educators about internet safety, security, and ethics. She also works with law enforcement. That was a great anecdote this morning. It got the students' attention, as did many other things. Uh, and she is not only an educator, she's a mother, an internet safety expert who has appeared on Dr. Phil today, HLN, Dr. Drew, and a number of different radio and TV programs. So we're fortunate to have her here. So help me welcome her to the stage today. Alexa, do I look pretty? Alexa, can I have some 
dum dum shop can Barbies and candy pops from my birthday. And Alexa came to life and said, Oh, you want all these things? I have them on Amazon. Here's how much they cost. Would you like me to send them to your house? And my four year old very politely said, Yes, please. So two days later, when the box arrived with all the things inside, I found her grandparents sent her an early birthday present. The lady is running through our house screaming that it's from her best friend, Alexa. <laughs> she thought there was a person living inside this pod, granting her every wish. I think she may have just seen a laugh. So here is her little baby granting her every wish. This all starts to make sense to me because two days earlier, Shy Fox and Toilet Paper showed up at our house. And I thought that I ordered on Amazon and forgot, and it turns out it was laying in her bathroom screaming, Alexa, I need more toilet paper! <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what she did for toilet paper in that moment, but I don't want to know. I never asked that question. Um, so I always tell the story to the kids, and I ask them the next question I ask them is, should Lainey be in trouble? So what do you think? Should my four-year-old be in trouble for this? No, of course not. Whose fault was this that this happened? Um, right? Totally my fault. The kids always say, no, it was me. Uh, because here I am as a parent in the situation, and I handled I handed my child advice and forgot to explain how it worked. And I do this for a living. I talk about how technology works for a living. So I can only imagine what goes on in other people's homes. Because how many of your children know more about technology than you do? Yeah, absolutely. Even if you're super tech savvy, your kids will still know more about the apps they use, the games they play, the shows they watch, the music they listen to. Because technology is like slime. They decide what's trendy, not us. And so we're constantly just trying to keep up with whatever it is that they're using. And it's not like you found TikTok and said to your children, here's this new fun app, you should try it, right? It's them hopefully bringing these things to your attention. Are any of your kids using TikTok right now? Yeah, it's all great at the moment. So we've got things like TikTok, and we have Instagram, we have Snapchat, we have Twitter, we have Facebook. Kids are not on Facebook, that's for old people like us, right? Um, and Instagram, they barely use that anymore because then all of their parents got on Instagram, so we could kind of see what they were doing, so they all left that with Snapchat. Um, and so now it's about TikTok and House Party, you know, House Party, and House Party is an app, it's a, like a social app that allows them to chat with a whole bunch of people. My favorite part about House Party is that when you are connected with a friend of a friend, in parentheses, it says stranger, right? That's what House Party has moved to because kids don't understand what the word friend is, but we'll get into that. Um, but all of these things that we do with technology, there's the good side of it, and then there's the not so good side of it. But the majority of the problems that we have with technology revolve around behavior and habits, and not the technology itself. The biggest issue we have with technology is a lack of understanding as to how the technology works. And that's what I spent the day explaining to the kids. How many of you understand what the internet is? Yes, yes. We've got a few people in here that really understand it. So I call the internet, I don't know if I call the internet a black hole or a vortex. Because everything we say and do online gets sucked up and dropped into this vortex and then spit out in other places for people to find. And so a long time ago, we had internet safety experts that said things like, don't put your name, address, and phone number on the internet, and all will be well. But that is utter nonsense. We have got to stop saying things like that because it's not true and it doesn't make any sense for kids. Let me show you something. There are lots of websites like this, but this is just an example of one where I can look up anybody, and I really mean anybody, by a name, email, phone number, username, address, or even a list of your friends. So I can take a child, if your kids ever had Club Penguin, or do you remember Club Penguin? Yes, you got seven through 12, then yes, okay. So either Club Penguin, or Roblox, or Prodigy, or Animal Jam, or whatever it was, that first account they created, throw them into a system like this and pull up some information. I can take some of their friends that they're on the streets with. Do you know what the street is? This is when they go back and forth with Snapchat and they have to keep it going. They can't stop because if their street dies, then they're no longer in Lego and then it's like a whole mess for them. So I can take all this information, throw it into a system, and look at their family. This is my family. It's my mother-in-law. And so when I pull up her name, I can see her gender, age, ethnicity, marital status, occupation, level of education. I can see a map to where she lives right now and where she used to live. I can see who lives in the house with her. This is where your children are supposed to show up. It's underneath your name here. Now, has anyone heard that there's a law called COPPA that says that all children must be 13 years old in order to have social media? So most of your kids are probably 12, 13. Yes, in this crowd? Okay. So the reason they're supposed to be 13 is because of this, this these websites that I've shown you. It has nothing to do, honestly, with their safety, per se. It has everything to do with the fact 
that the internet is not allowed to spit out all this information about an individual publicly until they're 18 years old. So how do we know when somebody's 18? They basically use social media and say the day a user starts using social media, we just have to wait five more years to make all this information we've been collecting about them and their family since they were five years old and put it on a website like this. So that's actually why it's supposed to be 13. Um, if your kids got a Musical.ly account when they were in third or fourth grade, which is what TikTok used to be called, then they end up with their own profile page, usually around like 14. But my favorite part about this site is that I can see what my family likes to do. I can see that we play sports, we hear about what we live and we cook, and we travel, and we donate to causes of the Amazon. That's a lot of information, right? Okay, so I know that some of you are probably sitting here thinking, holy cow, this is dangerous. And here is one of the big misconceptions, one of the biggest houses of all. No, these sites by themselves are not dangerous to your personal safety or your children's personal safety. Why? Because there are more than 3 billion people who log onto the internet every single day. What's going to make somebody pluck your name or your child's name out of thin air and go look them up unless we've given them a reason to look us up? That's really what this is. Internet safety isn't about trying to hide your name after some phone number. That's impossible. And by the way, it's information that we often want to give to different services online in order to get the things we want. I asked the students today, is there any information or any kind of content, anything you would just never, ever, 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 ever post online? And all the high school students said, name, address, phone number, credit card, social security number. And I said, wrong, 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 wrong. wrong. Why? Because if you ever want to order a Domino's pizza online, you've got to give a total stranger your name, address, and phone number, and your credit card information. When you go to apply for college, you're going to put your social security number into the system. Information online is situation specific. There is no you must or you can never. It's got to be dependent on the situation. Do I want them putting their name, address, and phone number on their Instagram feed? No, that's just silly. But is there going to come a time when it needs to be online? Absolutely. Internet safety isn't trying to hide your information. It's really about kids understanding two things. One, they need to be careful about the amount of attention they draw on themselves. Because with something like this, if they're going out on YouTube and they're going, hey world, look at me, look at me, look at me, and they think the more subscribers they have, the more popular they are, well, then they might have a problem because more people are going to be interested in knowing more about them. But the bigger <laughs> issue with internet safety is when they hide the things they're doing, the places they're going, and the people they're talking to from you. That's actually the dangerous part about the internet. That kids don't realize that the World Wide Web is a community with a trillion places to go and three billion people there. It's the largest community they will ever be a part of. How many of you still ask your children, even if they drive, where they're going? Yes? How many of you ask, what time will you be home? How many of you ask, who are you going with? Right? Exactly. If we're asking in the physical community, we need to be asking in this online community as well. If we don't let our kids walk out the front door and not ask them where they're going, why do we let them wander a community with a trillion places and three billion people and feel like we can't ask them where they're going? We've gotten to this place where we started to think that their digital world is completely <coughs> separate from us, when really we're their parents in every room, not just in the physical. And when we start to understand how the internet works, how the technology works in general, it allows us to have different conversations with our children that are much more meaningful to them. Has anyone in here ever tried to have a conversation about a specific piece of technology, and then your children talk circles around you to the point where you think that they know more than you, so you just give up and say, do whatever you want? Am I the only person who's had this conversation? No. And it's because when we try and parent technology, we lose because of this issue that they know more about this specific piece than we do. Um, however, when we talk about behavior, that's a whole other ball of X. One of my favorite things that I hear young people say, and I remember saying this myself, is this is just what gen our generation does. You don't get it, mom, dad, you're too old, you don't understand, you don't get it. This is just what teens do today. It's not inappropriate because it's normal. Has anyone had a conversation like that with your teenager? Right. What does it mean to normalize something? It means that we justify whatever it is we're doing in order to continue doing it. Believe it or not, predators use normalization in order to prey on victims. Uh, they groom their victims, which is the type of predators that we have online. Predators online don't just see a picture of a child and like, show up in the school or in the house and take them. That never happens. 
I've worked with federal law enforcement now for 16 years, and you've never seen a case like that. Predators grill kids. They make the kids think that whatever it is they're saying or doing is normal, and this is what everybody does, and so therefore they should be doing that too, to the point where the child believes that that person knows exactly what they're talking about, and they choose to be with that predator. Not all predators are 50-year-old pedophiles who want to do bad things to kids too. That's the other thing we have to stop saying to our kids. The minute we say, oh, it's a stranger you're dating with, it must be that 50-year-old predator, right? No, it could be another 14-year-old boy or girl and they video chatted with them. And so what we say, when we say it's a 50-year-old predator, means nothing to them. But when we ask the question, okay, this is what your generation does, but does it make it safe? Does it make it healthy? And does it make it right? We start to change the conversation. One of the best things we did in my house is we have this block of wood in my house. It's the charging station, and inside there's a USB block. And we now have three of them because there's five children and two adults in the house. And so there's a lot of devices. But that charging station is our hub. It is our starting point. And with my younger kids, it allows me to give them technology rather than constantly take it away. And for the older kids in my house and for the adults, it serves as a reminder that there is a time and a place for everything. How many of you have seen the normalization of a family dinner with the devices? Has anyone been to a restaurant recently and you look out and you see that there's a family sitting there and everybody is on a device, including the adults? And you think to yourself, oh my gosh, that's so sad. They're not even speaking to each other. Everyone's just on a device. But then has anyone ever been a participant in that dinner <laughs> where everybody is on the device? We've done it, we've seen both sides of it. We recognize that it's not necessarily healthy for our relationships, but yet we continue to normalize it so that we don't have to stop what it is we're doing. Why? Why do we get to that place? What has happened where all of a sudden we started to think that whatever was going on here was more important than what's going on right here? In our house, we do not bring any devices to our dinner table. We just don't. Nobody does. And when my husband first, when I first said to him, listen, we've got to do this, because believe it or not, my kids were actually starting to push back and say they were feeling it for And they didn't like it that dad was constantly saying, but it's for work, it's for work, it's for work, it's for work. It was that justification. But it didn't stop them from feeling ignored. And so he said, so they said to him, hey, listen, we're feeling totally ignored. We don't like it. And my husband said, but listen, I'm home for dinner every single night. I am present. I am here. But yet, he was missing half the conversations. And although he thought he was very good at multitasking, he didn't realize that he was still missing kind of those pivotal moments that the kids were trying to include him in. So we came up with a compromise. And I said, just try this. Instead of you bringing the phone to the table, why don't you leave it on the charging station? It's two feet away from you. If it rings, ding, vibrates, notifies you, then you have to actually get on a call. Get up from the table, go in the other room, take the call, and when you're done, come back. And everybody at the table thought this was a good idea. And so that's what he did. And he did it twice. And then he realized how much he was missing by getting up and actually leaving. As you guys know, you're in a place in your lives right now where you get such limited time with your children. Right? How many of us feel lucky when we get 20 minutes a day of their attention? They're so busy with all the different activities they have and with homework and with their friends. But those 20 minutes at the dinner table have become kind of the sacred time for us. Do you know why it's so important to have face-to-face -face communication with people? You want to know why? Because smiles are contagious. It's, it's really true. When somebody smiles at you, and it's a true smile that reaches your eyes, it actually releases endorphins in the, other person, in the other person, and it makes them feel good and happy. You don't get that same release of endorphins through screen. Even if you're FaceTiming with somebody, you can really be enjoying the conversation, but you don't get that same kind of happy feeling that you do when you're face to face. And it's because humans need physical connection. That's just the truth of it. We need those moments. And so when we break those moments, we're not only hurting ourselves, we're also hurting the people around us. I was telling the kids today that one of the worst things they could do is text their friends late at night. And they're like, why? Why is that such a problem? We're communicating. You know, we're hanging out. And so because if your friend isn't allowed to have their phone in their room with them, they wake up in the morning to 250 unanswered text messages, which really totally stresses them out, and that's how they start their day. We don't always realize how our personal actions have this ripple effect on others. 
So that was one reason why we put that charge in station there. Some of the other reasons have to do with sleep and things like that, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Do you have any questions so far? So as we go through this thing, as we go through all of this tonight, I want you to keep in mind, is it safe, is it healthy, and is it right? One of my very favorite things that the students <coughs> say to me all the time, and when people, parents say to me too, is don't worry, it's a private account. Yes? It's a private account. What does that mean when we say it's a private account? I'm going to have you talk to the person next to you. And what I want you to discuss is what is the definition of the word privacy? Now, a couple of things. Please don't tell me it's the opposite of public because that's an antonym, not a definition. Please don't tell me it doesn't exist on the internet that's not what I'm asking. And please do not use the device right now to look it up because that would be. Okay, <laughs> talk to the person next to you. What does the word privacy mean? Go. <laughs> Okay, 
So when you enable a microphone on a device like this, or something like Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok or any of the social media, you might want to read the privacy policy when you allow that microphone. Because what you're doing is you are allowing that company to record you while the app is running in the background. They pull out those keywords and they sell it, that information, to match with those third party advertisers. So that's why you'll just be talking about something and you haven't even searched it and you start to get advertisements for it. It has to do with microphone and social media. Okay? Do you have any questions about this so far? No? Okay. So who's the other group that controls everything that we put out there? This is a group we forget about. It's the people that we shared with in the first place. So I told the high school students a story earlier and I want to share it with you. A couple of years ago, I had a mom come to me and she said, I have the best idea ever. I told my daughter over the summer, between junior and senior year, that she should take screenshots of everything her friends were saying and doing online. And if she didn't want her friends to know that she was taking a screenshot, she would just take a picture of a picture. Snapchat tells you when someone's taking a screenshot. So she was taking all these pictures, she was taking all these screenshots and text messages and, um, and posts and comments and groups that they were affiliated with, and she made folders for each one of her classmates. She was in an all-girls school in Los Angeles. And in October, when they had their college there, and somebody came and set up all these groups, and there were all these universities there, this young lady would wait for one of the classmates to walk away from a particular college group, and then she would walk up behind them and hand the recruiter a folder about that particular student. Because the mom thought, this is a great way to get a leg up. My daughter is going to have any pick of whatever university she wants because of all of these damaging images that she had of her classmates. And I wish I could tell you it did not work to this young girl's advantage, but it actually did. So one of the photos that she had taken, uh, she had taken a screenshot of, there was a young lady in her class that was trying to get involved. She wanted to play volleyball at a particular university. And she had a photo of this young lady dancing on the table at a high school party with a red cup in her hands. And the volleyball coach basically said, we don't even want to touch this. We don't even want to know. We don't want to go there. I've had employers who have searched through, sort of just done a Google search. I have employers that do Google searches all the time in HR. And they just kind of see whatever is public. They're not hacking in to private Facebook pages or Instagram accounts or anything like that. They're just looking at what's on the surface. And so what these employers will do, though, I one of the employers was one of my former students. And he came to me after a session, and he's now in his 30s. And when I had him as a student, he was 16 years old, and I'll never forget this, we were having a conversation about employers possibly looking at things. This was a long time ago. And the kids had a really hard time wrapping their head around it. That's never going to happen. And even if it does happen, who cares? When I'm a teenager and I'm doing all these things, when I become an adult, I'm going to know that teenagers do dumb things and someone might capture a picture of it, and that's just the way it is. Now he's in his 30s, and he works for a law firm. And part of what he does is he searches new associates. He searches up new associates when they apply for internships. And I said, well, wait a minute, what changed? Because you were adamant about the fact that when you were 16, you were going to do dumb things, so other 16-year-olds will do dumb things when they were parents and adults. He said, yeah, that was my dumb teenage brain. Now I have my adult brain. And he said, especially if I'm looking at photos of young girls in very provocative positions or young boys who are doing super dangerous stuff, I don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. And I thought it was so interesting that here was this young person who was so positive that it wouldn't matter. But as he grew up, and he, you know, his frontal lobe started to engage. That's the part of your brain that's responsible for reason, logic, and impulse control. Teenagers do not have a working frontal lobe. It, they just don't. It, this, is, this is neuroscience. This is not making being cheeky. Uh, the frontal lobe doesn't develop in females until about 25 to 28, in males is 28 to 31. And so in, when they don't have, and there's nothing about intelligence here, it's not that. It's just neuroanatomy. But when they can't think past their 16-year-old brains, they're making decisions for themselves that may have consequences down the line, and it's hard for them to see it. But when we talk about a lack of control, that's something tangible for them. Understanding that when I put something out there, my peers get to control it. What are certain things that just don't belong online ever, 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 ever? We never give up control of this. You know what I'm talking about? You just don't want to say it. <laughs> They're naked bodies. We do not want them. We do not want them giving up control of their bodies ever in any way, shape, or form. But 66% of teens between 12 and 17 say that they either sent a new picture or received a new picture. 
66% of teens say that they either sent one or received one. That's a lot. Now, it is, it is, uh, it is a crime. It's actually, it's, uh, it falls under the federal jurisdiction of being um, a sex offender and child pornography. And so, um, oh, sorry, sixth graders. All right, so I had six sixth graders two years ago think that it would be really funny to take their cell phone if they were to sleep over, stick them down their pants, take pictures of their genitals, post them on a fake Instagram account, contact all their classmates, and invite them to the account to play a game where they match the boy to parts. <laughs> Six grades. Six grades. Um, so it took, they had turned off geolocation, they tried to mask their IP address, they even put like blankets and sheets all around them to make it so no one could see what house they were in, so no one could see the floor tiles or anything like that. Uh, but it only took the police about 45 minutes to locate these six boys and show up at the house. Not only did they show up at the house, they showed up at the house with all the other boys' parents, with a forensic team and two warrants, one for their cell phones and one to arrest them. Because these 11-year-olds produced, distributed, and possessed child pornography. The way they got caught, one of their classmates, this little girl, when she saw this, didn't understand what she was looking at, and showed it to her mom. Mom totally freaked out. She's like, who's sending me pictures of that? And the mom called the police. They think that it's Snapchat, and so it's going to disappear after two seconds. Or it's a private Instagram account with fake names, so nobody's going to know who I am. But what they don't realize is that they get outed by the people they shared it with in the first place. So the consequences for these boys, originally the prosecutor looked at it and said, this is a, this is a registered sex offender issue. Like, he was going to put six 11-year-olds on a registered sex offenders list for the rest of their lives. Um, that ended up not happening. What they ended up doing is the boys were on probation for three years, and during that time they took classes to learn why they had done what was wrong, and they had to be preparation, they had to write letters to everybody that they had shown this to, and then they could not use technology while on probation. Not a cell phone, not TV, nothing. Their parents say it's like a disaster for them. Um, and so, uh, if one young man last week say he'd rather go to jail, like, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, this is the best case scenario. Um, but they can't use any technology unless it's specifically for school, and then it has to be supervised by a parent or a teacher. And that was the best case scenario here that could happen. They don't always realize, though, the law doesn't always get involved. They, they don't. The law does not, I said 66% of teens have done this. So it tells me the law has not always gotten involved. But even though there may not always be a legal consequence, there's always an emotional consequence that comes when you share your body with somebody and you have no control over your body. We need to have those conversations with our teens. I know they're not comfortable conversations, but they're important ones. For them to understand, when you talk to them, remember when they were little and we talked to them about their private parts, right? This is my no-no zone. You guys do, there's like a whole song in their no zone. Okay. So to me, this is all the no-no zone if I choose, that it's the no-no zone, right? I, I'm the youngest lady, she's absolutely tiny, not that we don't grow up very big in my family. And so she's really small, um, and she, she has this huge vocabulary, and this huge voice, but she's the size of four-year-olds. And so people pick her up constantly. They think she's like a little doll, and they go to pick her up. And it's like, no, 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 this is all the no-no zone. You do not get to pick her up. She gets to be in control of who touches her elbow or who touches her hair. And that's when we start talking to them about when they're four. So why don't we talk to them about this again when they're 14, 15, 16, 17? About being in control of their bodies at all times. Some of the things that we see is it starts very, what they think innocently. It starts with a provocative picture. It starts with, you know, it started at the beach, or it started at a pool party, or it started between a couple, and somebody decides that, you know, that they're really, they want to take their relationship to a new level. That's where a lot of this starts. I call it anonymous exhibitionism, especially with teenagers, because when they're behind that screen, all of a sudden they feel empowered to kind of figure out who they are and what they like and what they're willing to do via text. Because it feels safer than doing it face to face. But in doing that, they give up so much control. And that's the piece that we want to make sure we talk to them about. Do you know what the average age of child is supposed to be pornographic material is? 11. 11 is the average age that a child is exposed to something like that. And I, I was explaining to the high school students today, I didn't explain how to get to them. I explained, though, that we did in my comments. But what I explained to the high school students today is that the part of the brain that's growing and developing at 11 years old is the limbic system. It's the emotional part of the brain. And so you're taking this growing emotional brain 
with this young person who probably hasn't held hands with anybody yet. And you're taking an adult fantasy and putting it on top of an 11 year old emotionally growing brain. And what do you think that does to a child? It normalizes what they see in these films. It normalizes it and it makes them believe that that's what real relationships look like. And so it's up to us as parents to talk to them about what real relationships look like. You don't have to talk about porn, but you do need to talk about love and respect and caring and kindness so that our kids understand the values that we place on relationships and are getting it from this content that they can unfortunately access pretty much anywhere. Questions? Am I terrifying you because I'm really not trying to? I want you to leave here today feeling like, okay, I can go and have a conversation about when they say it's a private account. The next time they say, don't worry, it's a private account, your response is going to be, what does the word privacy mean to you? And then the next question is, are you okay giving a control of that particular content to those people? And that's really where the conversation needs to start. Okay. One of the other, one of my other favorites, don't worry, it's a private account. How many of your kids have networks of people online that far surpass the number of friends you truly believe they have? Their definition of a friend is somebody who has, in, as long as there are at least six mutual friends involved, that's a friend. <laughs> they believe that if it's another child, that's a friend. But they don't spend any time thinking about whether or not that person is safe, right, or healthy. One of the things that I talked a lot today about the kids is what relationships look like. What do you value in a relationship? Let's start there. Let me ask you that question. Okay, how do you talk to the person next to you? What do you value in a relationship? What's important to you? Okay, talk. Go. Deal breaker for me. 
And he said, no, 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 no. He said, I'm really good at multitasking. This is just what our generation does. And she said, you're obviously not that good at it because I left 15 minutes ago. For her, the value that she placed on that respect and on the caring and on the connection um, was so much more important than dealing with him table texting and thinking he can multitask. Talk about multitasking too. Um, when our kids that were making these connections, how many of, well, I won't ask it like this, but I, sometimes kids will tell you about relationships that they need, relationships that are developing in the real world, but don't want to tell you about relationships that are developing in the online world. Why? Because they're afraid we're going to freak out and take it away. They're afraid that we're going to think it's a 50-year-old pedophile who wants to do bad things to them. We can't possibly imagine that it's another 14-year-old, 16-year-old, 17-year-old, somebody that they truly have an interest in. But one of the things that's really important for us as parents to talk about is that this whole idea of stranger danger is just, we don't talk about it anymore. No more stranger danger. If I take the word stranger and the word danger and separate them and never say them together again, I would. Because not all strangers are dangerous and not all people who are dangerous to your children are strangers. 96% of children and teens who are sexually abused are abused by someone they know, not someone they don't know. And so as they're developing these relationships, it's a friend of a friend, they truly believe that this person that is a mutual friend or is a child is their friend. And so the best thing for us to do is not freak out and try and take it away, but instead ask to be a part of the relationship, ask to at least meet the person. When Thomas was about 12 or 13, he met his very best friend, Ricky, playing World of Warcraft. They're 21 years old now. They were playing World of Warcraft, which is why I play World of Warcraft, and Thomas and I still play World of Warcraft together on Sundays. Um, and they, he came to me and he said, listen, I met this kid, Ricky, and he's really funny, he lives in Chicago, and I know he's a kid because I video chatted with him, so don't freak out. And I love when Paul conversations with the kids start with don't freak out, because so it instantly makes me want to freak out. But I said, fine, can I meet him? And Thomas said, really, you want to meet him? He said, he lives in Chicago. I said, fine, can I Skype with him? And I did. I Skyped with him. I Skyped with his parents. His parents were actually very grateful that they got to Skype with me because they thought that Thomas may be that creepy predator that they had been warned about all these years ago. And the kids went off to the University of Arkansas together a couple of years ago. They're still friends today. And what I had said to Thomas back then is, someone's important to you, they're important to me too, and I don't care where you need them. Because the relationships that they develop, the only thing that is dangerous, and it doesn't matter if it's in the real world or in the cyber world, is when they're hiding them from us. If they're hiding them from us, either one, they're being groomed by a predator who is convinced them that they should hide it from us, or two, it's a relationship that they already know isn't good for them. And so we want to kind of break down these barriers of only stranger danger in the digital world and instead talk about if someone's important to you, they're important to meet you, no matter where you're going. That's part of our personal safety is that my kids understand that I want to know what relationships are going to have. That's one part of it. Um, do any of you have know code words or passwords that you guys use? If your kids are at a party, they can text you with an X, and that means that they need you to pick them up, those kinds of things. Um, if you don't, it's, it's just a good idea to go over this with them. Have some sort of personal safety plan in place. Um, my favorite is when Thomas was a freshman in high school, and he asked me, he said, if I text you with an X, can you please come pick me up from this party? Because it was his first high school party, and he was worried there might be drugs and alcohol there. And Thomas just wanted to be in law enforcement his whole entire life. And so I said, sure, I'll come pick you up. And he said, but I need you to actually come inside and be in the scene. He said, I'm sorry, you need to do what? He said, well, I'm a little bit of a loser who's just like, oh, I'm going to go home because I don't want to be here, so could you just come in and, like, freak out? Sure, why not? <laughs> why not? So I, I get the text and I go in and I start shouting, Somebody find me, Thomas. He snuck out of the house. He's not supposed to be here. He was grounded. Somebody find me, Thomas, right now. And all of his friends are going, Dude, dude, you gotta go. You gotta go. You're in so much trouble. This gave him so much street cred with his friends. It was ridiculous. Um, they still, last Thanksgiving, a bunch of his friends came over for dessert afterwards and they said, This is Gats. Remember that crazy night? We freaked out. We came to get Thomas and we dragged him out of the party. That was epic. Like, you know what? I want to tell you that wasn't real, but I can't tell you. Know, <laughs> Now I've gotten smarter over the years and I no longer go in and make a scene. And now if somebody texts me with an X, I call and I say something like, something just happened, I need to come pick you up right away, I'm really sorry, and then that's the end of it. But we want our kids to know 
what to do if they're ever in a situation and they're not sure what to do about it. It might just be a sleepover that they're uncomfortable with. But having those kinds of conversations are really important. You also want to have a code word if they can't tell you that something is wrong. Meaning that they call you, if they don't normally call you mama, that they call you mama when they call. And you know something is wrong and you're going to turn on find friends or like through 16 and you're going to go get them wherever they are. But having those things in place, having conversations about it, takes away this whole idea of spying and it turns it into personal safety and personal safety plans. Um, last year, uh, I lived in Oak Park, California, where we had fires last year. And so uh, no one had ever heard of my town until the fires just ran right through it. And that was the very first time we had to use one of our personal safety plans in that way. Um, and the night before that happened was the borderline shooting. So we had a shooting that was like five miles away from our house. It was a really bad week. Um, but what happened is the night of the borderline shooting, so Laura went to Calgary, which is the borderline is the bar that all the Calgary kids go to on Wednesday nights. And this was a Wednesday night. And so she normally got this country line of the the lungs, she has great time. And so when I found out about borderline shooting at midnight, I started calling her and texting her, and she was not responding. And I was absolutely freaking out. And I was about to get in my car and drive to a crime scene because I was so desperate to know whether or not she was okay. And then I remembered that I had a personal safety plan in place. When the kids got to about 15, they started saying, we don't want you to have all of our passwords because we think you're going to troll our accounts. And I said, fine, if you don't want me to have them, you know, just have them, I'm going to get a pig. A, not a real one, a horse from pig, a piggy pig. That has no plot, it has no plot. So you can take a piece of paper, put all of your accounts, all of your usernames, all of your passwords into this piggy pig, and if you come home and the pig is smashed to smithereens, you know I won't. And that satisfied all of them. And I had never broken into the pig until the night before the went shooting. Because what I remembered is that Laura's icon account was on that sheet. And so I was able to go into it because we had not said to turn on my 360. And so what I was able to do is look at her phone and find that she was not there. I would have done something really dangerous and really dumb had I not had that in place. The next day when the fires hit, my personal safety plan of what to do in case of an emergency when we have to leave the house quickly, I think of doom and gloom all the time. Like this is just where my brain goes. But um, in their closet, they all have a list that says, in case I ever need to leave my house very quickly, I will bring. And so it's a list of all the things that they would bring with them. Now, be careful with this list, because I allowed my then five-year-old to make her own list, and so her goldfish was the only thing on it, and we had to take the goldfish with us, because I promised that whatever was on the list would come with us. But just by having those few things in place gave me peace of mind, and it also allowed my children to know that they were safe. Questions? How do we use technology to create safety plans? Okay. But YouTube pays me money. One of my other favorites. How many of you know people, not you, not your children, where they derive their self worth from the number of likes, views, or subscribers they have? Where you've got a whole group, a whole generation of young people that do this. Refresh, 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 refresh. Waiting to see how many likes, views, or subscribers they have gotten. When my kids were little, they would do this thing where they would jump up and down, especially with my hands. Like, mommy, look at me, look at me, look at me, watch me jump, watch me carve, watch me fall off my train, and break my arm. And my response to my kids has always been no. And I know that makes me sound like the meanest mom in the whole world. But I started doing that when I realized that when I did say, oh, yay, good job, I actually didn't care. Not even a little bit. Because I felt like somebody was shoving it in my face and making me say something that I just didn't want to say. Do your tricks. Jump up and down. Laugh. Dance. Play because you want to. And then give me an opportunity to notice. Don't be like a kid on the playground that's constantly going, do you like it? 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 Because nobody likes that kid. We've gotten to this place where our children think that everything they think, everything they do, is picture-worthy and sharing it out with the whole wide world. Do you know that less than 20% of tweets that are posted on a daily basis are actually read? Less than 20%. Which means that people are just putting stuff out there and nobody cares. But yet we keep putting stuff out there. We keep giving up control of our content. We keep begging people to notice us. And why? 
why have we done this to ourselves? A lot of it is because we have started to derive our self-work from peer esteem and peer esteem alone. And it's not just young people who do this. Sometimes grown-ups do this too, right? Sometimes grown-ups put up a picture and they get really excited about the picture, but then nobody likes it, and then they take down the picture. Why did we post it in the first place? Were we posting it to get the likes? Or were we posting it because we were excited to share something? I'm, I love Julia Roberts. Julia Roberts is one of my all-time favorite actresses, and she was in my audience a few weeks ago, so I couldn't tell the story because she was standing right there, so I got a little bit nervous. But um, I love her because she shares her talent with the world. She has this incredible talent, and I get to benefit from it when I see her on the big screen. She's not doing it because she's waiting for people to like something that she has done. We've got the Logan Pauls and Paul Brothers for that. Do you know who the Paul Brothers are? Logan Paul and Jake Paul, um, they're huge YouTubers along with like PewDiePie and, and, and Ninja and all these other people. But the, Lo the Logan Brothers are really interesting. There was a documentary done by somebody named Shane Dawson, who's another like, YouTuber. And the Logan Brothers actually talked about the fact that they have sociopathic tendencies that they really do not care how they make other people feel. This is what they were talking about. A few years ago, Logan Paul went into a Japanese suicide forest, and he videotaped a man hanging from a tree. Then, he captured that image as his thumbnail image, so that was the first thing that showed up on YouTube, and didn't bother to tag it with any adult content tags, which means that it ended up on YouTube Kids. The day that it went viral, I happened to be on YouTube Kids with my niece because she wanted to watch a Shopkin surprise video. Do you remember those? That's when the kids watch somebody else open a Shopkin to see what it is, and they're like, woo! I don't get it, and they love it, so okay. Um, we went on to look at a Shopkin surprise video, and what's the, what's the thing that's trending on the home page of YouTube Kids is a man hanging from a tree. Logan Paul exposed my five-year-old to suicide without any care of what he was doing, because it was all about the subscribers, the views, the likes. We don't want to raise another generation who derives their self-worth from that. So how do you combat it? Well, we ask the question, what's a healthy way to feel good about yourself? All right, I'm going to make you do this one. What is a healthy way to feel good about yourself? What do you do on a daily basis where you're like, yeah, I feel good about myself right now? OK, talk to each other. Go. Yes. 
say yes. Yes, they can. Teenagers, and we can too, but we're not as good at it as they are. Ask any teenager to show you multitasking, and they will. They will have six different group texts going, while well, Instagramming, Snapchatting, changing an iTunes playlist, and watching How I Met Your Mother at the Office on Netflix. That they can totally do. Okay? What they cannot do is you can't learn while multitasking. That's what we need as adults. We just don't say it that way. We say you can't multitask, and then they say, yes, I can. Let me show you. Can a child do math homework while watching TV? Sure. Are they going to learn anything? Absolutely not. No. What happens when we learn is, so that part you see there, that's called the hippocampus, and the green part, that's called uh, your prefrontal cortex. And when you're learning, there's these things in your brain called synapses. And the synapses carry information from, uh, from one location to the other until it gets to the hippocampus. And then when it's in a straight line like this, learning happens very efficiently. That's when you're only doing one thing at a time. When you're multitasking, your synapses look like this because they have to gather, they have to grab this piece of information and that piece of information and that piece of information. And all of those things will hit the prefrontal cortex, you do something with it, and then it disappears. No information is actually being stored to long term memory. And that's why multitasking and learning doesn't work. What are some of these things that make the synapses jump? Well, your child has their cell phone while they're doing their homework, and they look over for one second because somebody just added something to the group text, and it's only a second. And they look over, and now all of a sudden, they completely lost focus, and it takes the brain five full minutes to learn back up again. And they don't wait the five minutes, so then they just move on to the next thing, which means they lost that first piece. It's not going to stay for very long. I asked the kids today, if any of you ever studied for a test and well, three days later, you don't remember any of the information, and like 90% of their hands go up. Why? Because this is how they're learning. They're not actually committing anything to long-term memory. And so that takes a much more focused approach. Why are video gamers so focused on video games? Because their synapses look like this when they are playing a video game. Video gamers have better periods of concentration than social media users. Because social media users toggle between one thing to another very quickly. They're constantly changing the theme, where video game players are focused on one particular mission and what they're trying to get to. Video game music also is huge in the space because the music, and are any of you gamers? Okay, am I the only game? Okay, so I love video games. I've been playing video games my whole entire life. And video game music is totally repetitious. It just repeats itself over and over and over and over and over again. And that lines up synapses. So the kids say, well, can I listen to music while I do your homework? And the answer is yes, as long as you are not singing along to the lyrics. That's why they say classical music is good, jazz music is good, video game music is good. I listen to Dave Matthews and Humphrey and Sussex, I can't understand a word they say. So you've got to find the right path for you. But when you are, even when a child is studying, and if we as a parent come in and we say, are you doing your homework? Guess what? We just make those synapses jump. Or when we accidentally think our children have their phones turned off and they don't check them during the day, and so we shoot them a quick text because we just need them to know something for after school, we actually make their synapses jump. Because even though they know they're not supposed to be looking at that text, they get very concerned that we are trying to get in touch with them, and so they're going to go ahead and turn it on anyways and take a look. And so we actually sometimes break that concentration during the day. If, and it happens sometimes where you've got to send the text. I totally understand that. But if at any point in time you hold that text until after school, you're going to be doing everybody a big favor. But that, that's the difference between multitasking. Multitasking is real. It's just the ability to switch from one task to another very quickly. It's not the ability to do everything all at once. That's why when we're multitasking and we've got our to-do list, our to-do list is often longer at the end of the day than it was in the last piece of all of this is, uh, oops, is the I'm healthy enough. That don't worry about all the screen time. This is just what my generation does. It'll all work itself out. Everything is just fine. Are any of you concerned about screen time and how much screen time your children are getting? Okay. So let's talk about this. First of all, there is no magic number about how much screen time is healthy for a child. It does not exist. When the American Academy of Pediatrics came out, I don't know, it was maybe 15 years ago, and said that children should have more than two hours per day of screen time, that was an obesity study, not a technology study. And what they were saying is the more kids sit, the bigger they get. 
In fact, if you look at gamers today, gamers do not work the way that they used to. I was at a, I was at an esports conference last year in Las Vegas, and they look like athletes now. Because what the gaming community has even discovered is the more physically fit you are, the more mentally agile you are. You're faster when you're physically fit. You also have a better understanding of the game when you actually throw a football or kick a soccer ball or shoot hoops. Not only that, the gamers started to develop something called myopia, which is a which is an eye disease, which near something is basically. And so we thought it was from staring at the screen. It's not. It's a vitamin D deficiency. It's because they weren't getting outside enough. And so we started to create some of these health problems for ourselves without even recognizing it. One of the biggest health issues that we have right now is really it's, a, it's an ergonomic crisis. It's a problem with their, with their posture. Is that we've got kids that are constantly in this position, and when they're like that, it puts approximately 60 pounds of pressure on the spine, and it's causing a curve in their spine, and it's causing bulging discs and bone spurs in their necks. There's a whole new field of pediatric chiropractors that did not exist 10 years ago because of the way that we hold the devices. Do you know how you're supposed to sit when you're using a device? Okay, do you need a quick favor? Everybody sit it nice and straight. Put your feet flat on the floor. Put your elbows at your waist. And so let your hands drop naturally. Where do they go? They go in your lap, don't they? They don't go up here. They go in your lap. And now look straight ahead, which is where your screen is supposed to be, and pretend to type. Yeah, is this all how we sit while we're using our devices? <laughs> no. Most of us do not. But from an ergonomic standpoint, that's the best way for us to sit, which is why typing is so important. Um, we should practice something called 2020, which is every 20 minutes of staring at a screen, you should look at least 20 feet away for 20 seconds to allow your eyes to adjust. Every 45 minutes to an hour of being at a device, you should get up and move for at least 15 minutes because you need to move more than you sit. We spend, it's not just for our kids an hour of physical exercise a day, they need to move more than they sit. This is why so many of us are now on standing desks or on treadmills while we're working and all these different things we're doing to try and save our bodies. We've got to save it for them too. Uh, there's a lot of research that's coming out that says, you know, do not allow boys to put their laptops or anything on their laps or their cell phones in their pockets. This has to do with the heat of the batteries um, that is causing issues with sperm mobility. We don't know what's happening with young ladies and their reproductive organs because they haven't bothered to study this. The medical field, there's huge biases in the medical field um, where, I think, you know, it's everything from our bodies are just like men with pesky hormones, and so they don't bother to study this. Um, don't get me started on that, sorry, I'm going to get that across. We're going to hold it around, but it drives me crazy. But my feeling is, I'm very much about mitigation of risk. So when I understand that there's no magic number with screen time, how do we decide what works for us? And so in my house, this is what we do. First thing we ask is, do I have time to be doing this, or should I be doing something else right now? Starts with that. Do I have time to be doing this, or should I be doing something else? If I should be doing homework, if I should be sitting at the dinner table with my family, if I should be sleeping, then it's not necessarily the right time for me to get to the office. The second one is, have I moved more than I sat today? Did I get enough physical exercise? Or have I just been, I sat at school for seven hours, and so now I'm going to sit at home for six hours, which just isn't healthy for my body. Ergonomically speaking, am I holding my devices correctly in a way that's not going to hurt me? But my last one's my favorite. Does my behavior actually work? And this one is for so many things. If you've got a child who has a social media account and they are deriving their self-worth from like subscribers' views, then for right now, they may not, they may, maybe you should shut down that social media account. Because it's not healthy for their emotions. It's not healthy for their mental health. If you've got a gamer who can't stop gaming, maybe for right now, it's not the right game for them. I had a young lady ask me today if violent video games were causing um, violent acts and aggression. And there was an article that somehow was being circulated on Facebook recently that was talking about how Fortnite was causing people to go out and want to shoot other people. And that's just not true. Um, like this, is, this was not this article. I don't understand where it came from, but the research does not support this. Um, we do not see any sort of direct correlation between violent video games and violent apps. What we do see is a correlation between violent video games and a lack of empathy. Because that's why first-person shooter games were created in the first place. They were created for the military to desensitize soldiers to having to kill other people. And so when we allow our 11 and 12-year-olds with these emotionally growing brains to play these games where they are killing other people, what we're doing is desensitizing them to the violence. So for some kids, it doesn't bother them. For other kids, it makes a really big difference. 
But if you start to see in your child that they behave differently after watching a particular show or playing a certain game or using social media, that's the time to shut it down. Because it's better for your physical, mental, and emotional health, not because the technology is bad, but they're just not ready to use it. Yes? What does the research say about all the increase in suicides and its relation? that there is a direct correlation between the rise between suicides and social media. That their emotional well-being goes to what I was talking about, about how they derive their self-worth. And so when they're seeing that other people are doing all these fabulous things and they think their life isn't so fabulous, it sends them deeper and deeper and deeper into the hole. And the biggest issue with social media is it's always with them. They can't break away from it. Because they feel that if they go offline for whatever reason, if they leave that social media platform, then they suffer from what's called FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. And the idea of being disconnected from their peers is so overwhelming to them that they continue to put themselves in a negative emotional state just to make sure that they're still connected to their peers, who are putting them in this sad emotional state. It's this vicious cycle for them. Um, and when we start to see that a child is being affected, we have to step in. That's when we say, uh-huh. I know more. I may not know more about this particular social media platform, but I know <coughs> more about your physical, mental, and emotional well-being, and this just is not good for you. Yes? For, for some kids, but this, I want to be really careful when we talk about addiction, because less than 6% of teens are actually addicted to social media. Less than 8% of teens are actually addicted to video games. I, it's not, uh, and I think it's something like 12% are possibly addicted to pornography. So the porn one is the, is the highest. So the addiction piece, when you look at addiction, there are physical, emotional, and mental signs of addiction. It's not just the bad habits anymore. It's that they no longer want to do anything else other than that. They no longer get joy from other things they used to get joy from. They've become secretive. They've become isolated. They no longer hang out with their friends. They won't talk to you. So the addiction piece is, is I say that for you know, that, that word for kind of the most egregious cases. Questions? Any other questions? The last piece of this, and then I'm done, I know I'm over my time and I apologize. Um, but the other thing, if I could get everybody to do one thing tonight, it would be this. If we could all get the devices out of our bedrooms, it would be so much better for everybody. There are several things that happen when we take these devices into the bedroom at night, and this is why this is another reason why we have that charging station. So everybody in my house, before they go upstairs to go to bed, everybody docks their device on that charging station. Um, and it works really, really well. Again, it's serving as a reminder. Why do we do this? Because when you take a device to the bedroom with you at night, three things happen. First thing that happens is there's blue light that comes through the device. It's not actually blue, it's a spectrum of light. And the light messes with your circadian rhythm. It makes your brain think it's daytime instead of nighttime, which is why all your pediatricians told your children, don't look at the device an hour before you go to bed. But your kids are super smart. They just put night shift or flux on, or they dim the light, or they wear you know, blue light removing glasses so that they can get rid of it, and that does actually solve that problem. But that brings me to problem number two. Nobody gets off the device when they say they're going to get off the device. It is always one more comment, one more text, one more episode, one more game, one more, one more, and now it is way later than they meant for it to be, meant for it to be. And for teenagers, what do they do? When you see a light on and start walking down the hall, you shove the device under your pillow so you don't know they have it, which brings me to problem number three, which is the science issue. And it has to do with something called electromagnetic force, EMFs. And EMFs is a form of non-ionized radiation. I had a couple of kids come to me today and tell me that their cell phones are causing cancer. And that's not what I'm saying. This is a non-ionized radiation. Non-ionized radiation is like radio frequency waves. They have been in our world forever and ever and ever and ever. And uh, you know, as a scientist, the, the idea of EMS was really, really hard for me to realize that there was anything problematic with it because there are these tiny little particles that don't even like penetrate the skin. So how can they possibly be problematic? And then I got to see what happened during the sleep study on a functional MRI, and it changed my mind. When you have high levels of EMS, in your bedroom at night, usually with about 10 feet of you. Those EMFs penetrate the pituitary gland of the brain and suppress the production of melatonin, which is the hormone that helps us fall asleep and stay asleep, just by being in the room with us. So we are disrupting our sleep all night long. A lot of people think, oh, I turn into airplane mode or do not disturb, it'll stop the notification, and then that will help me sleep. That is not the issue. 
issue I am talking about. Because that issue is something different. The, um, when you turn into do not disturb and airplane mode, what you're actually trying to do is avoid uh, being alerted that something is trying to notify you, that they're trying to get in touch with you. But you know what your brain does? Your brain likes that feeling so much of getting that notification that it starts to look for it even when it's not happening. It's called stim. And it's called phantom vibration syndrome. You think your phone is vibrating even when it's not. That's when you know your brain is constantly searching for that dopamine. That's an addiction, right? That is part of an addiction when your brain starts to trip you like that. But these EMFs are slightly different. So anybody have a cell phone that they can completely power off for me so I can share what this looks like? Do you mind? Is it powered off? Thank you. Okay. I like to power it off because I'm going to show you that it doesn't matter if Wi Fi is turned off or airplane mode or anything like that. Oh, nice. This is, the, this is what comes out of the cell phone. You guys see that? Okay. That's the amount of energy. It's at $31.99. And what did I say was the state level in your bedroom? $35. So almost 10 times what the what the state level is for not for not creating this dopamine issue. Now you do need to understand the waves dissipate in the air, and so the further away the device is, the less it's going to affect you while you're sleeping. But when I talk about getting out of the bedroom, for the kids, it's for these three reasons, right? But for us as adults, there's a fourth reason here. And I'm not saying this is happening to you, I can only talk about myself. But my husband and I have been together since we were in seventh grade. I told the little kids a story today about how we, how I bullied him in middle school and made him tell him he was making middle school dance. And he didn't end up taking two because he found out that I was asking him not my best friend in the middle. And he eventually forgave me about Mary and Ken, so it all worked out again. But, uh, about five or six years ago, I think it was a little longer, six or seven years ago, we were fighting constantly. And it started because our, our that two-year-old got left at preschool twice. And she got left at preschool twice because of a lack of communication issue between my husband and myself. What was happening is we were sitting side by side in bed, and I'm on my device, and he's on his device, and we are telling each other what we need the other person to know, but we were not having the same conversation. We were talking about two totally different things. And so that lack of communication was really starting to take a toll on the relationship. And at first, my husband said, no, it's my alarm clock. I need to have a device in the bedroom. I, I like to look at my emails right before I go to bed. You know, it, it was, there was a whole bunch of reasons why. And I like to also. And I finally said, can we just try it? Can we try it for two weeks and just see what happens if we get the device out of the bedroom? That was almost seven years ago. And we never thought of that yet. Because what we realized is that was kind of like our, safe, our sacred space where that was just the space for the two of us. Um, also, we've got no expectation of privacy with these devices. No expectation of privacy with these devices. So we don't want private devices in private spaces. We've stopped bringing them into our bedrooms. We've stopped bringing them into the bathrooms. Of course, we bring them into the bathrooms. It's a bit other issue. Um, but when we kind of take a step back and we ask ourselves, why? Why is it so necessary for us to be connected all the time? Have we created our very own electronic reach? Where people think because we can be accessed, we should be accessible all the time. And that's just not the way we want to live our lives. If you are a doctor and you're on call, please keep your device with you at all times. But if you're not on call for whatever reason, if you can get them out of the bedroom, it's just a good place to start. Any last questions? Please. Any hard times Yes, all electronic devices. Um, you know, people ask me about televisions, and the reason TVs are different is just because of the distance. Usually, it's <coughs> across the room from you, and so those waves disappear into the air and don't usually cause problems. Um, but there was a study that came out not too long ago that was linking migraines to falling asleep with a television. So, I don't know the wording of that, though. Yes? Like Wi-Fi routers, same issue. Yeah, we don't have them in the bedroom. We just, our Wi-Fi router is in the summer room. My, my house is not pretty. I mean, we don't even do, we don't do homework in the bedrooms. So my house is set up in a way that it's kind of organized chaos. But uh, the reason we took all the dust out of the bedroom and put it in the living room was we were able to put the router down there too, we gave everybody faster connectivity. And also it made my kids much more efficient in their home. When they couldn't be in their bedrooms, they got things done a whole lot faster. And when you've got five kids in the house ranging in age like that, uh, people would always say to me, but what about the little ones? The little ones got relegated to their bedroom during homework time. 
Um, I also tend to, now that I just, now that I just have the two, I just have a 13 year old and 8 year old in the house, um, I tend to do my work when they do their computer work too. So we all kind of sit in the living room together, we get it done, and then when we're done, we turn everything off, and that's going to be the end it. It works some days, it doesn't work every day. And the homework builds and things like that, it doesn't work all the time. But they are definitely more efficient out than their better. Please don't go home though tonight and like make every single change we're talking about. <laughs> like please do not do that. That would be way too overwhelming for everybody. But by starting with just something small, whether it's you guys getting your devices out of the bedroom or asking them to do it, or just talking about privacy as control, or personal safety, having some sort of plan, small little bits organically works much better than a giant overwhelm. Is there a question? Yes. Same machine for work. Um, for working gaming? Yeah. It's, well, I, I don't use, no, I don't use my, I have a, I have a gaming PC that's specific for my game. And then I have my work computer. So I do, I do tend to separate those devices, especially because of the type of work I do. Yeah, they have, excuse me, they're using for, for all work, that is switching for the game. Ah, yes, okay, so that's where the gaming PCs come in. So my kids, they do the same where they, or actually, by the time they're teenagers, it's a TVC. They tell me what they're doing, they break me along, and they check before they change. So what that means is, if you need to do homework, you tell me, I've got to do homework, I'm grabbing my Chromebook or whatever it is, and I need to go do homework. Okay, fine, go do your homework. If I come in, though, and you're watching YouTube videos, you told me you were doing homework, you did not tell me you were watching YouTube videos. So that doesn't work for me. I have three rules in my house. You don't disobey a direct order, you don't lie, you're not disrespectful. I grew up in the military family. Um, when they switch, when they do that switch, to me, it's like me saying that you go to Starbucks, but I didn't tell you you could go to the arcade. Right? Um, when they're younger, it's the ABC, it's an ask, bring me along, you can show me what you're doing, and then check before change, but by the time they're this age, they're not asking, they're tough. It's kind of nice though when they do tell you because it gives everybody a quick minute to be like, all right, you know what though, we're gonna have dinner in 20 minutes. You sure you wanna start that right now? Because we're gonna have dinner in 20 minutes. It helps them with their time management, especially for your middle schoolers who do not understand time management at all. Not at all. It's really tough for them. And when you say something like, okay, you've got five more minutes, that means nothing. The better thing to say is finish the last thing you were doing. And so when they do tell you, okay, I'm going to be playing the game, a bunch of kids were talking about Fortnite today. Are they still playing Fortnite in middle school? Yes, okay. So um, in every community, it's different. But, you know, when they're playing Fortnite, you need to know how long a mission is going to take with that squad. You need to know that stuff. That's why they got to bring you along. Because then that way you can say, don't start a mission with that particular squad because it's going to take you longer than what you have. Right? Yes? Uh, how... Uh, there's so much coming out every day. There's so many new apps, new social media apps. Yeah. Common Sense Media is the best. Common Sense Media is an online resource. They are always on top of things. I love them a lot. I use them too. Um, but the truth is, is, the best way to know what the newest app is is to pair a virtual group. Right? Um, I'm not a proponent of sign. Right? I'm just not, especially not at this age. If you need to periodically, you know, if they give you a reason to look at something, by all means, pick it up and take a look. But you do it in the middle of the night while they're sleeping, and then they, you think that they don't actually know that you're doing it, they totally know you're doing it, you are much better off just being transparent and letting them know, I'm your parent in every realm, in the physical realm, in the digital realm. If you give me a reason to look, I'm going to look. Okay? But most of the time, you don't need to read all the text messages. You, you really, really don't. Uh, because their behavior is going to let you know that something Right? But to keep up, when you periodically just walk by and look over your shoulder and ask them questions, not judging them. That's the biggest reason why they hide the stuff they're doing online, is because they immediately assume that you are going to judge them and you're going to shut it down. Because what our idea of inappropriate is, is not their idea of inappropriate. And so by asking more questions rather than judging it, that helps too, right? Yes. Could you guys hear, uh, so I just this is kind of on the way home. <coughs> it sounds like you guys do use technology in open areas of your house. Mm -hmm. um, so does that, like, I heard you say, like, go home to the bedroom at night, but it sounds like you have no technology in your bedroom at all. Right? Yeah, 
it, most of the time. Yeah. But I will say that sometimes it does. If I've got a sick child at home and they're in their bed, like, like you know, I, I'm not, none of my rules are like oh, those kinds of things are so set in stone that I can't be lenient about it. But most of the time, no, I really do try and keep all the devices out of the bedroom. You know, if you ask any doctor, they'll tell you the bedroom's only for two things, sleep and I don't talk about that. Um, but it's, so we do. We try and, and when they take stuff into their bedroom, they automatically assume that they have privacy. And that's really when they make them their biggest mistakes, is when they think that they're not going to get caught and nobody's ever going to find out and wants to see it. It gets harder over. Yes? Sorry, guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, is there any problem um, that you have to allow us to monitor your? I mean, like, I, I think we're just going to find that if someone's going to do this, if someone's going to do that, there's not really anything that sort of kind of catches it all that you, you have to be in. There's nothing that catches it all. Um, I, you know, listen, and the other thing about monitoring is you find out after the fact, right? Okay. It's, it's not, it's not going to prevent them from getting the things. Those are filters. Um, and listen, you can try to put filters on if you want. You can try to filter out adult content. It's really tough to do, and I would always recommend using whatever is native to the device. So if you're using like an iOS device, use something like screen time. If you're using Android devices, use the uh, parental control that come with it. Because the minute you start putting outside software on these devices, you mess up a whole lot of other things, and then you're constantly frustrated and going in and bypassing the, bypassing the passwords and things like that to try and get it to do what you want it to do. Um, so you can definitely try. I think putting filters on for our younger kids, if this was an elementary school talk, I would definitely say give it a shot. Um, but by the time they're in seventh grade, it's kind of this, it's going to cause more problems for you than it's actually going to help. Um, there are a few, I like screen time, which is on the iOS devices, because I think it actually helps kids with time management more than anything else, which is kind of a big thing for them. Um, you can also do it where, with screen time, and also on Android phone with parental controls, you can do it where you block just what's considered adult content. So it's pornography, um, gambling, and violent sites. Uh, however, that doesn't stop all the images from Google Images coming from. And so even those kinds of things will not catch at all. So um, but you can try this. There's one called TeenSafe, which is a subscription, uh, which will show you some stuff, but it doesn't show you all the stuff. And the minute your, the minute your kids have one Instagram account that you link to that monitoring software, they just create a second one. Right? It's called a fit stuff. If you hear them talking about fit stuffs, that's their second Instagram account. Sometimes they call it a spam account. Okay. All right, on that note, I'm going to say thank you to all of you for being here tonight. If you have more questions, I would say about business cards with me. I really appreciate you guys being here. I hope it was helpful. I hope you guys have a wonderful